Welcome. It's a, I'm thrilled to be honored to, and honored to present our speaker uh, this evening, Matthew Rone. Um, we, his exhibition, Project Gallery Matthew Rone, will be on view at PAM until January 15th of 2017. The exhibition uh, is, brings together beautifully crafted works. If you haven't had an opportunity to, to visit, I definitely encourage you to do so after our talk. Um, these works are made from wood, fabric, and clay, and they range in size and scale. As Diana Nowy, the associate curator who organized the exhibition, um, says in her essay, Ronay's forms give a, gives us a sense that we can both view their exteriors and their interiors. The rich surface of each work allows our eyes to trace its textures and moves along its ridges and suggests deep space. We can imagine ourselves entering and traveling in, inside them. In putting together this talk with Matthew, I had a few very lovely conversations, and I got a sense of his, his care and attention to detail. So this evening, we're in for a treat. Matthew will present a talk on five individuals who have influenced his artistic practice. Four. Four. Oh. <laughs> uh, four individuals, and the presentations will range uh, on inter in interdisciplinary topics such as wavelengths, biology, some other, I'm not going to go into specifics anymore, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, but I will end with looking at some of his own works. Um, I need to thank uh, Andrea Rosen and Corey uh, Nomara of Andrea Rosen Gallery in New York, thank you so much for your support, and Mark Fox from Mark Fox Gallery in LA. In addition, I'd like to thank uh, Claudia Schmuckley at the Baffler Museum in Houston, with whom we are happily co-publishing a book on Matthew's work. So without further ado, let me introduce Matthew. Hi, everybody. Um, I want to thank everybody at PAM, especially Diana, for um, helping me to, to do this exhibition, and, and Andrea, and Mark, and Corey, and Bangu, and everybody, and Franklin Sermons. So um, I'm, I'm always kind of psyched to give a lecture on one hand because it gives me a chance to reinvestigate some things that I'm thinking about my work. And I think in the last several years, like one of the topics that I keep coming back to more and more is how does creativity actually happen? How does imagination happen? Where does it come from? And, and what's it connected to? And so when I, when I talk about creativity and imagination, often, often I'm talking about the actual things that are made, but, but also sometimes, and equally as important, I'm talking about how do we talk about what we did, and how do we imagine what its meaning is. <clears throat> and often, I guess, creativity can be autonomous, and often it can be um, institutional. Um, but for me, I think it's really part of the unconscious. And so I think it's interesting to think that in, in the, in the uh, Middle Ages that sometimes people thought inspiration was demonic or angelic or um, that it came from outside of you. And, and my experience is that it comes from inside of me. But I think th the thing is, is that I'm part, since I'm organic and I'm part of the world and the universe, I started to think that maybe it's possible um, that my imagination and my creativity is a function of natural phenomena. And I guess natural phenomena are studied in biology and botany and physics and astronomy and stuff like that. And um, so I, I changed my work a little bit over all these years and it's become a lot more abstract. And in, in its abstraction, one thing that I found really difficult was like, how do I talk about abstraction? And like, w what kind of language can I use to convince people that I'm not just putting stuff together and that it's non sequiturs and that I'm an idiot? So, so I, I've really struggled over the years to find a, a place where I can meet to talk to people about what I do. And 
I stumbled upon this work called The Science of the Dogon, which is, I, I could have heard it referred to as guerrilla scholarship, which may be a nice way to say it could be a conspiracy theory. Um, but this book about the Dogon people from West Africa um, presupposes that um, their creation mythology uh, is very similar to Egyptians, and that the Egyptian mythology, uh, cosmology, and creation mythology um, may be the beginning of science, and that this book proposes that it's possible for a tribe that doesn't have a written language that, that has created its worldview and architecture and sculpture and symbology, that they may have knowledge of the genesis of matter, meaning, and by that I mean they may understand what physicists now currently understand somehow, intuitively. Um, and so in, a, in the book, which doesn't have that many illustrations, you see something like this where, you, where on the bottom is a Dogon drawing and on the top is a drawing of the orbiting of an electron and that they share this blatant commonality. Or something like this, the bottom again, the Dogon drawing and then the top chromosomes, spindles during mitosis. And this really, really excited me because it made me feel like it's possible that what I'm doing isn't just some sort of fabrication, that I'm actually kind of vibrating with the natural universe. And that kind of led me to, to follow this kind of haphazard and maybe contrived idea that there's something empirical or inspirational about creative, intuitive absorption. And so, um, as I, I've kind of concocted this lecture to put together, to try to super glue that idea to a series of artists that really inspire me and to kind of show through their work how it might be um, embodying this idea. Um, so, Let's see if I can do that. So the first artist that I chose is a musician. His name is Terry Riley. Uh, he was born in America in 1935 in California. He's a minimalist composer. Um, minimalist music is, is not quite like classical music from 1912, but it's, it's, uh, it's strange music, and I'm going to play some of it. But Terry Riley was a student of a guy named Lamont Young, who was the father of minimalist music. And Lamont Young, people who have been to New York may know he has a place in, in Tribeca called the Dream House where he plays long, his music is long drawn out tones. So if music is 12 tones, uh, at least the, on the uh, Western scale, he takes one of those tones and draws it out all the way to the other tone over a long period of time and supposedly um, kind of created all these vibrations in the body. Since everything in one way or another is, is vibrating, he kind of had this idea that maybe his music could create some sort of emotional response by, by stripping it of all the normal things of music and just getting down to the frequency. So Terry, was, Terry Riley was a, a student of his, but he was much less dogmatic than Lamont Young. And, um, and his music became this kind of organic, boiling, trans, it, it, transforming from one state to another. And, um, and I, I find and think that it's really possible that this music, which is hypnotic, repetitive, crystalline, that it, that it may have something scientific about it. And um, these, I want to play um, excerpts from these three records. It'll only take a minute.
So my idea for this is that these works, imagine if these works are somehow inspired by something like water freezing and thawing out again, or water boiling and then, thaw and then cooling down, and that, and that maybe it's not a direct and dogmatic way to experience science, but what if, even in an unconscious level, these, these, um, these pieces of music are somehow mimicking in harmony something completely natural? Um, the, next, the next guy that I want to talk about, somebody that I'm really obsessing right now over, is this artist, Serge Charchoun. And this is him in like the 60s. Serge Charchoun was basically a second, what people understand him as, is a, is a second-rate cubist. Um, he, he, but to me, I really think he's absolutely one of the more fascinating examples from a fascinating period when, uh, you know, from like around 1915 to 1925 when everything is going completely bonkers uh, in music and art and everything. And he's Russian. He arrives in Paris at about 1912, and he's friends with all the normal people. He's really an artist artist, this, this guy, and people throw that around a lot, but he was really supported by people like Miro, Duchamp, Max Ernst, and then even later, somebody like William Copley. Um, he coined a term about his own work called ornamental cubism. And I think on, on, a, on some level, a word like ornamental or decorative has always been really flabby, but in an age of, in his age of so many macho painters, he, he really was modest, humble, and even kind of purposely hid in the, in the shadows. He did have some success. And um, I find his works to be really pleasantly empirical, that I believe that they come from some sort of diagramming, like in the same way that maybe an Alfred uh, Jensen comes from. But what, I was exposed to these works. I can't wait to get to my favorite one. Um, I'll go back to see. But these, this, is the, this is my favorite work of his. And I was exposed to this work in the, the, um, this book, The Spiritual and Art, 1890 to 1985. I guess everybody in the world probably has this book, art people. But, um, but the book was a show that was done in the 80s at, at LACMA. And, the, the concept of this show that I think is really fascinating is that on one hand, abstract painting on the Frank Stella kind of level is about changing painting. But, and, and there's something pure and formal about that. But on a whole nother level, this show in, in LA says that like, maybe abstract painting is about something else, like the occult or um, science or alchemy or something of this nature, and I think, I'm not sure, I wasn't around, but I think it was really quite a big deal. I've read some reviews of the show that people were really kind of annoyed by the idea that there could be something more to abstract than a formalist reading. But our guy, Serge Charchoun, he, his way of creating is incredible. So this, this painting here, the title of this painting is Movement of a Painted Film Based on a Folk Song. So Serge Charchoun was drawing on film, and his drawings were inspired by listening to music, and then he would project this film and then make a painting based on his experience of looking at this film. And so when I started researching S Serge, I realized that I think that he may have been a, a synesthete, uh, suffering from synesthesia, which is a kind of crossing of the senses where like perhaps um, when you hear the word Thursday, you, you think of orange or you see an orange shape or something like that. And he made all this amazing work that really was based on music and his experience of listening to music. Now, is that purely scientific? Probably not. But I do think there's something in the, in the wavelengths of, of light and in music and things that we hear and things that we can feel and matter itself that maybe comes through us and that we create, our creations are based in something possibly empirical. Um, so on one hand, I think you could call this second rate cubism, ornamental cubism, but I think it has a, real, a really a lot in common with Forrest Bess um, and some other just really weird 
I just think it's very strange work, and I think it's been grossly overlooked, and I'm really a fan of it. Um, and I think he was a really strange and magical person. And as an aside, one interesting note is that as he got older, he sometimes to the detriment of the body of his work would continue to just paint over works. And as he got old, older, kind of like a dog turd that's petrifying, he just like continually erased the palette. So it's like as time went on, minus this one series, you can see they just keep getting wider and wider minus this one kind of underwater series that he did, the, the works by 1965 are completely white. And um, William Copley describes having a studio visit with him where because of the pigment of white as lead, and he created basically as a hermit that he had a tiny little studio, he had to pull the paintings um, from behind the door and set them up in front of the door and they were so heavy that you felt trapped in his studio. So these paintings, I, from what I understand, are actually quite thick. Um, another artist who made that that really inspires me, um, that everybody knows, is Leger, and people know Leger is also as a cubist, also ma making work in Paris around the same time as Serge Charchoun, um, and they know him for his cubism and then maybe his figurative works. But I really love these works from 1925 to about to well maybe maybe 19 a little bit earlier in 1925 to about 1929. And these works, I feel like, are empirical maybe in their study of psychology. And that, like a great uh, nouveau roman novel, like a Robe Grillet novel or something like that, they're purely descriptive, but that, they're, but that their images somehow are, are they're like the pre-computer computer. Like they're mapping out some sort of thought, um, but, it's, but because it's based solely just in objectness, it's hard to get narrative, but you're getting something else, some sort of psychology. And I think, obviously, psychology at this moment is like becoming really interesting, and people are starting to really think about it a lot. And I really find these to be very psychological. But you can see, and also you can see, as he goes on, by the time we get to 1929, I think, they become very, very abstract, almost like a diagram. I think this is a fantastic painting. Um, but the work of his that I'm completely obsessed over from 1928 is this outlier of a painting. And to me, this painting is a painting of the interior of someone's deepest and darkest hang-ups, something that uh, Carl Jung may call the shadow, a part of your personality that's unrealized that may be a hang-up. Uh, it may contain the deepest unrealized things that you have inside your soul. I think that the, the, the effect of, of, paint, of, of centering it and having it be in this red field so that we don't know what size it is, it looks maybe like it could be a Mobius strip. But the amazing thing about this is that the title of the painting in French basically translates as holly leaf on a red background. And I, find, I found that at first kind of hilarious, but then I thought, well, of course, the holly leaf is this amazing creation of nature that people have adopted, actually, as having all this great metaphorical quality, especially like in Christianity, that it mimics Christ's crown of thorns or you know, something of this nature. Um, so the next guy that, that, uh, that I chose to share with you guys is this guy, Graham Marx. Uh, Graham Marx is a ceramicist that created from probably the mid-70s to about 1990. I first saw this work at the Reverend Al Shan's collection in Louisville, Kentucky, and um, I texted it a couple of weeks later to Matthew Drutt, and I, I knew that he knew a whole lot about ceramics, and so um, I wanted to find out if he might know whose work it was, and the funny part of the story is that not only did he know that it was a Graham Marx, but that his mother, Helen Drutt, who created one of the United States' first craft galleries dedicated to art, to high art in Philadelphia in the 60s, uh, worked with Graham Marx. And so I thought, oh, that's amazing, like this crazy, weird, like six degrees of separation connection. And I started looking at all of Graham Marx's works. And I found that these works, they, th this really kind of exemplifies the, what I'm trying to kind of prove here is that these works by Graham Marx, I feel like, 
are maps of cell structure, but at the same time, they're maps of the universe, I feel like. They, 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 um, they have this quality of, of feeling like he may know something about something microscopic in the same way the Dogon people knew something mi about something microscopic, but they didn't actually, they weren't actually able to see it with their eyes, but they intuitively understood it. And I feel like these Graham Marx sculptures, although on one hand they're works of deep personal healing, that they, that, that they, they have this vessel-like quality that's, that's broken and repose, that they, maybe perhaps it, it needs to be fixed or whatever. But I also started thinking that they really did feel like a map of the universe. And I started to do a little research on Vedic cosmology, and I found that there's this thing called the Bhumandala, which is a Vedic or Hindu kind of concept about how the universe is formed. And it really just blew me away because I feel like, okay, so on one level they're, un they're universe size, but on a whole, another level they're cellular and that they feel like organs or they feel like they're exploded eggs, their vegetable kingdom, um, celestial. Um, so for example, like this is a, like a computer illustration of a vision of Vedic cosmology, which I, or let's see, I think something like this. Okay, so they don't look exactly like a Grand Marx, but they have this like weird quality where they're, so these are levels, different levels of heaven and hell and the and Vedic cosmology. Um, the interesting thing about Grand Marx that I found out was that he, he, he became dissatisfied with the conversation around ceramics and craft and making art in general and actually retired as he was the director of Cranbrook Ceramics and then retired and lives in New York and has um, an acupuncture practice. And to me that actually kind of made me go full circle with this idea and that like not only did he maybe understand something empirical that might be studied in science but he also understood some sort of healing which linked me back to thinking that artists maybe always had something to do with something empirical like medicine, that they had some shamanistic vibes or that they understood, they understand the natural world but without dogma. And so we're left to make symbols and to try to decode, to de to decode what we do. Um, in a way, we can intellectualize it, but on another level, I think even though artists now aren't part of tribes, that maybe we, there are a lot of us that are creating as a way to try to cope or understand what our existence is and how it happens. And so for me in my work, I see that this comes out like in my deep appreciation of botany, um, of, of my mycology, the, the study of mold and fungus. Um, I feel like it comes out um, also like in my, my kind of working the, the quality that I do when I work is this kind of marking of time that has this feeling that I'm um, cr creating something that looks as if it's grown, that, like, that these aren't objects that were necessarily made by a human, but that they, that they, they grew themselves. And these works ha also have a lot indebted to sea creatures, things that we could never have seen, that we could never have imagined, that have insane colors, that exist in some sort of alien world that we actually live on, but we can't access. And um, for me, almost everything that I do starts with drawing without intentionality, just, just not, not waiting for inspiration, but on a daily or, or at least several times a week basis, drawing over and over and over again. And just by drawing and not waiting for inspiration to come, I, all this stuff comes out. And so I, I've started to really think in my recent work that I'm not coming up with a concept, but that I'm somehow participating with the harmony of the physical world. Um, and I think this comes, I think this starts with the body and that with the body, by focusing on the body, by understanding the body, by feeling it grow, by looking at it die, that you, you get this feeling that inside nature, are all of these psychological lessons and all of these intellectual concepts that, that things come into creation and then they stay stable for a while and then they become unstable and they fall over and then it begins again. And so for me, I think a lot of my work is about 
nature, the body. But also, at the same time, I think a lot of what I do is about um, technology. And these are all works that I selected because they have to do with the body. But um, and the body systems in a work like this, maybe this is like a, a respiratory system or a, a digestive system. <clears throat> but I think also some of the newer works that I've been working on have to do with technology as well. Um, and that even technology then starts to mimic the natural world and that some technology looks like a virus and that it does you know, different things. Um, and I think also this work that I make has a lot to do with things that you can't see on an atomic level that somehow I'm experiencing intuitively. <clears throat> this is the technology part. <laughs> I got ahead of myself. More boiling stuff. Boiling is very important to me. <laughs> but anyway, that's my thesis. I hope it worked out for you. I'm not sure if it worked out for me, but... Um, that's it. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to if we do a Q&A, because I feel like maybe I respond better, I can give a more honest and less prepared response if anybody has the courage to ask a question. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm a little sick, so I'll try to... Um, the colors in your, in your work, yeah. uh, they're, they're very powerful, yeah. and they don't look... They're there by accident. So do you have something, I mean, you're exploring something with your colors or? I mean, for me, I'm colorblind, I should say first. Oh. Um, and I've always used, well, minus a certain period in my work, I used to, I've, I've always used a lot of color in the work. And I, because I'm colorblind, I think I've always kind of thought of color as a psychological and semiotic kind of practice in the sense that it's like, I'm always going for a vibe, you know? And so I do color with my wife. We work on color a lot. And, and a normal choosing of color has a lot to do with language, in fact. And so it's like we're talking, we're trying to come up with, with, a, with a, a color version of the psychology of what the thing is. So um, like often color works that way. We want something hot that feels, you know, something maybe that feels like sulfur or that, you know, that like, I mean, we don't often do gross colors, but the colors that, that I use, the reason why they're so bright is because that's what I see. That's how I, that's what, that's what I can see. I'm not black and white colorblind, but I can see bright red, you know, and the interesting thing about colorblindness is that you can train yourself to see colors, but you have to really work with them like over and over and over again. And so often I'll say to Bangu, my wife, like I want to make a more complicated palette because like I really love color and I want to like be experienced like all the great painters that I love, but it's really difficult for me. And so we often kind of have not a battle, but we often go back and forth because I like what she calls uh, like classless color combinations, you know? <laughs> they're, they're not right, and they don't, you know, like, like, I think yellow and pink are really beautiful together, and she thinks it's tacky, you know? But it's like, I, but I think, like, so many great cultures use yellow and pink together, and it's got a really great, joyful, festive vibe, and, and I don't know, I'm just really inspired by color because it's so hard for me to understand. You're welcome. Hit it. I'm actually a botanist. Oh, shit. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but uh, what I wanted to Did ask... Did I do a terrible job? No, it was great. I loved it. I, I know Naomi Fisher. She told me to come and Oh, cool. Thanks, talk. Naomi. But I was, what I was wondering about, what were your early experiences as a child? Did you see, did you experience forms that, that have influenced 
and inspired you later in your life? Um, well, we, I mean, in my, where I grew up, there was a, we went to the park a lot. I walked in the park a lot with my dad. I have a terrible memory. So I don't, often when I'm asked about things like this, I don't have a way to really say what my childhood was like because I don't remember a lot. Um, I think I'm more of a present moment kind of person. Um, but there, there's a great park system in Louisville, Kentucky, where I grew up. And in my, in my neighborhood was on the edge of the park. And so there were lots of paths to walk through. And, and, and so I think that was it. My parents are also both pretty into gardening and, and uh, my dad doing photography of flowers and stuff like that, you know? And so like maybe comes from that, but I think like most recently for me, like, you know, I didn't show, uh, I didn't want the work to be all about my work. So I didn't talk about the different types of work that I've done, but over the last three years, especially in the last two years, I think it's really shifted into this area. And one of the experiences that, I, that I've had is that two summers ago, I spent about six weeks in Germany um, in the forest every day, walking around, foraging, looking for mushrooms. And, I, and I, I find it so meditative, like a walking meditation, and so like really nice to see what nature can produce. And it produces so many perverted and strange things that, that are perverted in our sense because they are reproductive and they do beckon you to come in and they do look like vagina folds or penises or whatever, you know? And it's like all those, all of my work, I think from the very beginning was always erotic. And I think that, I think that what I've re recently come to realize is that science is erotic, that it's about life and that, and that life is erotic. It's, it's both violent and pleasurable at the same time. And so I think I find a lot of inspiration in science, mostly because I don't understand it. I'm very educated in art, and so I can understand pictures and sculptures and things. But when I'm looking at nature, like I have such a reckless attitude towards it that I find it extremely fertile. Anyway, and is that doing good? good. OK. <laughs> Hi, um, thanks for your talk and explanation. I find your work really interesting and, and your explanation too. And I was wondering, because you reference so much science in the material world, if you could speak a little bit more about the materials that you choose to use in your practice mm -hmm. and any experimentation that mm -hmm. you've thought of or experienced. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I hate to disappoint you, but I'm not a big materials guy. Um, Jessica Stockholder was my was the director of Yale while I was there, and we battled so much because she would say, "Well, I don't understand why if your work is so crazy and nonsensical. Why you don't use nonsensical materials?" And I was like, "Not interested. Sorry. Like it doesn't. I mean, I do think that wood is a nice warm material. Um, almost everything I make is wood, and um, and I really." I will say materially what I really do enjoy and I think is interesting is that my process is subtractive. And so I'm taking away all the material. And so when, I, when you make a mistake, you can't necessarily put it back on. And I think, that's, I think that's a nice quality to making sculpture that's carved is that you take it away and either you, you do it right or you end up with a Giacometti, you know? So, I mean, the materials aren't super important to me. I mean, I, I think, I do think that wood is a great, and historical uh, sculptural material, you know, and it's humble, and it doesn't, I don't need a foundry, like I don't need to be beholden to anybody, it's just me and the tools and the sound of the tools when I'm working. So I, that I really value, you know? I can basically like meditate all day, like drilling holes into wood, and, and I find it, it really centers my being. Hey, um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little more on the kind of intuition that you say you go through when you're channeling, I guess, the, these visions of the microscopic levels mm -hmm. and uh, how that really functions in, and I guess, like, with, with memory and fact and all those things. Okay, I can do that. First of all, like, for me, I, th I feel like a non-traditional visionary vision having person because I actually, I draw a lot. And I actually, like I've said over and over again, I'm kind of getting like annoyed at this idea, but I still believe it, unfortunately, is that the, the imagery comes through 
my muscles. It's not willed. It's like a piece of paper when it's automatic, like the surrealist, like the, 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 the tip of the pencil goes onto the paper and it starts moving. And so like my muscle memory makes me draw certain kinds of things, tubes, holes, rings, um, eggs. Like I know that's a flat footed way to explain it and, and I'm, I'm rarefying it to make a point, but on a certain level it is doodling in a weird way. And that it's like, I feel like my muscles have a specific message and that message is like, it's built up, it's torn down, and it's built up, and it's torn down. But with memory, like, I don't think memory is like a super big, super big one on my list. Like, I think like definitely dream life, like anything, anything that the, the futurists or the surrealists use to create creativity, I think I'm totally on that page. So dreaming, psychology, um, in the past, drug use, or whatever, like whatever it need, you needed to, to kind of get it going. But, I read a, recently um, on the internet a, a Chuck Close quote, who I, I'm not a big fan, but he, he said, like, don't wait for your inspiration, just practice. And it just happens if you practice over and over again. So I don't, I'm never waiting for some big idea. I will say sometimes I do have visions, like I, I have made bodies of work where I did sit down at a piece of paper and it was like, and it was all, it all was there. But that's rare for me. I draw a lot and then I edit. That's my process. Not that exciting, huh? <laughs> practice, practice, practice. Discipline. Uh-oh. Sorry. <laughs> but it's interesting if you put the questions together because you're talking about, you know, there's this assumption from your lecture that you're talking about this intuitive and you just talked about it coming through this muscle memory but then you're also talking about how you talk for hours with your wife about color uh -huh. so it's this discourse and it's yeah, this, yeah. you know something that for someone else might be intuitive or this idea of an artist to be intuitive then there's this other part that is about both it seems to me that you come from a lot of content and mm -hmm. you've evolved a lot of content and you've imbued yourself with a lot of content and then it's also interesting to think that something that would be intuitive to someone else like color, yeah. is an opportunity to get very deeply again in discourse. So yeah. there's these, it seems like, you know, just to think about this idea of vision or visionary or just muscle memory would not maybe not be the full story. It's yeah, I agree. And I think, I, I think actually sometimes I'm shocked because, and, and disappointed sometimes in my practice because to make the sculpture is so he heady. Like it's so much planning, you know? And so I think, I think like, um, often with my studio mates or other artists, like they're like, well, why don't you just like get on the bandsaw and like rip it out and like do something like that? And and I'm working my way towards that. I really, I, I really do want to go there. But I, but I have so many ideas that I that I that I draw that I that I want to see become real. Like that's why they call me, they make fun of me and call me Geppetto because it's like I just want to like carve it out and make it become real and like you know what I mean. <laughs> And, and, and I think it's like really, I really like, I, I have a dual personality. Like part of me is very like organic and then the other part is like militant almost, you know? And that it's like, I must go to the studio and I must create and I must do the sculptures that have to be perfect that, you know, and like, and so like I'm working on that as tons of other stuff in my life I'm working on too. But that's, I, I really like, I know a lot of painters and I'm always really jealous like of painting because Painting, all the activity happens in this plane. And then sometimes after a year in five minutes, bam, you've got like Augustine, like you've got a great painting that just happened. Like, you know, I mean, he was like sitting around smoking and bur abusing his daughter, but like in one five minute thing, like bam, you know? And that never happens for me. I mean, it happens in my notebooks, but it's like a drawing isn't so fascinating as a painting. I mean, paint just looks anything, paint on anything looks great, you know? So it's like, I can't, a drawing doesn't ever have that power unless it's like a Hans Bellmer or something. And I don't have that touch either. So my touch is like in the crazy OCDs wood sculpture subtraction game. <laughs> okay. Is that it? Awesome. Thanks so much for coming.